Welcome to the webinar, everybody. Thank you for taking the time to join us this afternoon. My name is Jo Brinko and I'm Director of Learning at the College. I'm going to ask the other panel members to introduce themselves. So I'm going to start with uh, Sanjeev. Hi, it's uh, Sanjeev Manik here. I'm, I'm the Clinical Director of Examinations uh, at the Royal College of Pathologists. And uh, Helen? I'm Helen Mellish, um, Examinations Manager at the College. And uh, Nikki? Hi there, I'm Nikki. I'm Clinical Director of Training Assessment at the Royal College of Pathologists and a Neuropathologist by background. And uh, Matthew. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Matthew Clark, and I'm the Chair of the Trainees Advisory Committee for the College. Great, thank you. Matthew's kindly agreed to go through the questions with us um, this afternoon. So he's going to be asking um, the questions. We're going to work our way down from the top because those are the most popular ones and the ones that have been voted. Um, you can still submit questions and vote for questions during this webinar. So if there's a burning question that someone else has asked that you want to like, please do so. The um, details are on the left-hand side of your screen. So slido.com and then hashtag RCPathExamFAQ. That's the way to um, ask questions during this. That's the only way that we're taking questions. Um, we've limited this to questions about the changes, um, the upcoming changes to the to the delivery of the exam in the light of uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Um, we have removed, there have been a lot of duplicate questions, so we've removed those. There's just one of each of those and anything that's in the existing FAQs that are on the website. Again, we've um, removed those just in the interest of time so that we can get through the questions that we have got. Um, we have answered quite a lot of the questions in Slido. If you're looking at that in another device, you can see that you can't see it in this view. Um, so if they have already been answered, again, we'll touch on them briefly, but we'll, we'll keep going. Um, but anything we don't get time for in terms of questions that have been asked, we will answer them afterwards and we'll make this webinar available and the um, questions and answers on available on the college website sometime next week. Um, and just a reminder that there is an awful lot of information already on the college website on the examinations news and dates page. So that will also continue to be um, updated as we receive any more information. Um, conscious that we have got questions to get through we did think it would just be helpful to give everyone a brief overview of how we've got how we've arrived at this situation in terms of the decisions that have been made and what the college team have been working on um, ever since the spring exams were deferred um, on Friday the 13th which turned out to be quite significant for us um, so the first thing that we did um, following uh, the deferment of the spring session was we'll start to look at how we could deliver the majority of our exams in a different way in light of the ongoing pandemic and we surveyed the candidates to find out how they were feeling about everything um, what their preferences might be if we had to make changes to the examination and we got a fantastic response we had over 1200 um, responses to that and we've written that up there's um, that's on the website and also in the um, bulletin that's just come out this month um, and we use that information really to help us um, make decisions about what to do for the upcoming autumn session. The exams team also met individually with each of the panel chairs to discuss their examinations and what could be changed. We then did a full tender process very quickly but um, we went out to tender for a platform to be able to deliver the examinations online. We received um, five applications back and we interviewed four of those and obviously made the decision to go with test reach. Um, during that process, we asked six post FRC Path Part 2 trainees to help us. When we got down to the final two um, companies that we you know, were considering, um, six of those trainees looked through the tender documentation for both of those companies and came back to us individually and independently with their view on um, which one they would prefer. Um, we didn't feed back at the time and they don't know this so if they're watching or if they watch later they will we'll now find out that they all actually went for test reach as, as we did so um, that was a really useful exercise for us as well. We then had to go to the College Trustee Board for approval, um, firstly to introduce the change, but also particularly around the financing of this. There's been some questions about, is there a reduction in the fee? But um, for this session alone, to deliver the examinations online is about £150,000. So it's a significant extra expenditure that needed to be approved. Um, and we did that. Um, we've also been liaising all the way through this with the other colleges via Academy of Medical Royal College meetings, 
meetings held by Health Education England um, on behalf of other statutory education bodies and also the informal links that we have and all of the colleges um, are moving to online platforms if they haven't done so already and we're all using the same sort of three or four providers so test reach is being used by other colleges as well. Um, we've disseminated the information that we have on the website and through the college's social media channels. Um, and finally, we are in the process of waiting to hear back from the GMC for approval of these changes because um, for the medical trainees, all of our examinations need, do need to be approved by the GMC, including a chain, the changes such as this. So that process has been going on and we're waiting to hear back from the GMC, although we're confident that they will approve the examinations. Um, there are other things that have been happening as well. So you may have seen the temporary derogation um, that's been approved recently regarding the attempt. So any candidate that is attempting an online examination this session um, will not have that attempt counted towards their overall attempts for, for the examinations. That was approved by council last week and went up on the college website. Um, so that's a very brief run through of, of uh, months of, of very hard work, but should we kick off then Matthew with the first question? Yeah, thanks very much, Joe. So the first one is how long prior to the exam will we have to familiarise familiarize ourselves with the exam software? Okay, so I'll, I'll take this one. We're looking at the minute for about a three week period. Um, what I will em emphasise on this is um, it's not a one off chance that candidates will have to, to look at the system. They can, they'll be given a link and can go in as many times as they want or feel is necessary just to, to test it and see what it looks like, see how it works. That's great. So it will basically be, be there right up until the day before the exam for them. That's great. Thanks very much, Helen. Thank you. Um, what does the, an environment check involve and what criteria might the environment fulfil? If there is an issue with the environment, how is this normally resolved? Yeah, so we've, we've already answered this one, but just as a very quick reiteration for it, it's basically the candidates will show the proctor around the room that they're sitting the exam in. So it's basically don't have your textbook on the desk, don't have your revision poster up on the wall so that you can see your notes. Um, obviously, if they do, you know, check in that you're, you're turning your mobile phone off. Um, and obviously, if they do spot a big histopathology textbook on the desk, it will be a case of take that out of the room and go and put it somewhere else. I suspect my environment might be in need a bit of change here. <laughs> Thanks, Helen. Thank you. Um, so is it still acceptable to make paper notes alongside completing the exam online, e.g. when planning answers to the essay questions? Yeah, so again, we've, we've provided an answer to this, but just another reiteration, no, we, we're not allowing that, um, principally because we need to preserve the integrity of the exam and we, we don't know what notes people might be making. So it's just in case people are writing down exam questions to share afterwards. Um, there is a, a notepad feature in the software that can be used for that purpose. Thank you. Um, given the low pass rate, have the college put in place measures to provide guidance or support for candidates, for instance, a virtual lecture series? Um, I think not really clear for which exam this relates to. I'm going to guess it's probably the part two histopathology. Um, there are a number of exam preparation courses, mock exams out there. Um, that we don't have any direct affiliation with these, so they do exist. Um, but we do have guidance on the website, past papers, or the past surgical cases go up on the Leeds Pathology website. Um, we are putting up sample questions where we can. Um, and it, I don't know if Sanjeev's got anything else to add. I mean, all, all I would say is that, um, you know, we, we don't normally, the college doesn't normally provide lecture series like that. So the, the trainees and the candidates have to resort to their own uh, resources. Um, so I don't think this is anything different uh, on, on this aspect um, because the, the exam content is not changing in any way. I would say the other thing as well is just to, for the um, 
candidates to make sure that they have been able to have access to the training that they need to prepare suitably for the exam. We do know that there have been disruptions to training during um, COVID as well. Um, we have been very keen to make it clear to candidates that they must only sit the exam if they are ready and, and prepared to do so. Um, but you know, going back, speaking to their educational supervisor um, and their colleagues just to make sure that they've covered everything that they should expect to have covered by the time they're sitting their exam. And that goes for any specialty. And I, am I right in thinking, Joe, as well, that there is an extended period of time where candidates could actually withdraw from the exam if they if they felt that they that they weren't ready for it? Yeah, I think we've we it, we I think that period's come to an end. We've um, we did extend that um for an additional week this time round um but but the other thing to say as well is that if anything happens um coming up to this so obviously if um a candidate or a member of their family becomes ill which affects them being able to attend a, an examination if it's a face to face one for example then um you know obviously make the college aware and you know we will be sympathetic to those obviously we just need to make sure that that's that's what's happened but we will be sympathetic to to those sorts of things thank you very much thank you um for part two exams happening in person is there a contingency plan if candidates had to self-isolate due to contact with covid would they be able to sit sit in january um, so there, there will be contingency plans for a whole variety of situations because obviously um, my crystal ball doesn't work yet and I don't know what things are going to look like in October but for individual candidates um, in, in the part two exams where there's going to be a January sitting we would consider this on a sort of a case by case basis um, depending on the situation as to whether we could accommodate them in any of the centres that we've got in January or whether it might be a, um, having to defer people to, to next spring. I think the only other thing to add to that is that, um, you know, things may change at short notice, as we all know. Um, so we can't really make um, long term you know, plans and decisions. So but we, you know, we keep a close eye on what's going on nearer the time and have some fallback plans, but it may not be you know, possible to um, alert everybody. Uh, you know adequately so we'll just hope that you know nothing major changes between now and the exam time okay, thank you um what happens if we are accidentally disturbed during the exam either at home or in the workplace for example if someone accidentally enters the room um try not to let that happen remind everybody in your household or in your workplace put a notice up on the door um if it's a brief disruption someone walks in the room and goes oh no I forgot you were in the middle of sitting your exam um, that that will be fine if they promptly go away again um, it's obviously if somebody walks in and starts wandering around having a conversation with you that's that's when the the invigilator would in, intervene in the situation but generally we'd hope that the people the other people either in your workplace or or home would respect the fact that you're about to undergo a three-hour exam online and not actually come in and disturb you halfway through to check what time dinner is. So one, one other thing I would also add to that is just as, as a part of preparation if you're doing it from home is is it probably would help if um, nobody else is say using the internet at the same time. Um, you know it's only a question of a few hours because uh, that you know reduces the risk of any dropouts and all that kind of thing. So it's, it's, a, it's forward planning like that that we would encourage and, and be safe that way. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, for candidates attending exams in person, will there be a contingency plan if lockdown regulations prevent candidates, candidates slash examiners attending the exam centre? Yeah, again, as with the previous one, we're, yes. we're looking at a variety of solutions to potential issues and particularly local lockdowns. So examiners are fairly straightforward. If, if they're just needed for a face to face part of an exam, we can video conference them in for that. Um, we're going to look at, at options like sending all candidates from a particular area to the same centre, just so that if there is a local lockdown and they can't all leave the area, we can look at some other solutions for making sure that they can still sit the exam this time. But again, it's a, it's a case by case and as and when it happens basis. Absolutely. Thank you. I think the only other thing I would just add to that um, as well, Matthew, is that 
um, just for people to remember that we run a large number of different specialty exams that are all different or slightly different in format. Um, so some of the changes that other colleges have been able to make, they've been able to do because they're just running one format exam for large numbers of candidates. Um, and so sometimes even with the best will in the world, we may not be able to accommodate every eventuality that arises, which is, is what Sanjeev was saying earlier as well, but we will do what we can to, to try and mitigate that. That's the difficulty with a large number of specialties, isn't it? But yeah, <laughs> thank you. Um, could candidates take it at work with a consultant educator monitoring the exam or perhaps have, for example, five socially distant can distance candidates at each hospital site? Um, certainly candidates could take it at work, but we would advise that you don't have multiple people in a room doing the exam, that you are in, I don't want to use the word isolation, but basically you're on your own without anyone else disrupting you, especially if it's, for example, a, a specialty that has essays where there's going to be everybody typing all at the same time. Um, so, and the, they'll be um, proctored by the invigilators through the system. So it, we don't, you won't need somebody in the room to be watching you do your exams. Basically, we are advising that it's one person in a room at a time doing the exam. Just um, being somebody who's used to NHS computers um, and the stone tablets that they're sometimes used instead of actual computers, if you were doing it in the uh, NHS it would also be really really sensible of course to check things like internet speed and uh, technology capacity. I foresee issues there. Okay thank you. Um, so I think the next one we've kind of addressed already about contingency plans with sort of lock lockdowns, so we'll move on to the next one with that. Um, is there any plan to move to a modular system for the FRC path part two? Not for any exams that haven't already been memorised, is the short and short answer to that. <laughs> so again, it's because of the, 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 all these changes have to go through the GMC, it's not something that can just happen overnight with these things, and given the short amount of time it uh, uh, has been available to get the exam system back up and running, it's, um, that's not possible in this circumstance. Not, not for that level of change because, um, so the GMC have put in place an abbreviated um, approvals process for colleges to be able to move their examinations online. Um, for a, a change such as that to modularise an exam, that would come under the normal GMC process, which is um, many months um, of, um, of work, not just for the college, but then also going through the actual GMC approvals process and providing the evidence um, for the change. Um, there is now, so in addition to the work that we've been doing, as um, you will know, the colleges have all been also working to update their curricula and their assessment systems in line with the new GMC standards. So that work is also still ongoing, um, but has been delayed because the GMC are now diverted to approving the temporary changes to the exam. So there will be a slight delay to some of the applications um, that have been made to the GMC for the sort of you know, more normal, if you like, um, changes. So um, they, the GMC have been very specific about the type of change that they will accept um, for temporary approval, which is for us is the, the move, moving online. They've also said, haven't they, that we can't make any um, applications for further changes, should we want to, until after the curriculum uh, updates have all been done as well. So we would be looking at 21, 22 at the very earliest for that sort of additional change should we want to take that forward? Yeah, I mean, we are lucky in that we've got all of the pathology specialties in, in terms of the normal approvals process, they've all been submitted to the GMC. Some colleges are not so lucky, so they've been put back to, to 2021. But yes, the very earliest that we can now start making sort of more general run of the mill changes to the exams is next year. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Um, as the candidates have to type long essays, has the Royal College tested the average number of characters and the typing speed needed to pass a question? I think that's a tricky one um, because we will only learn about that after the event. Um, 
we haven't heard from these companies that there has ever been an issue on that front. So we'll just have to see how it goes. Uh, overall, we felt that uh, even from the survey that I don't think there was too much anxiety about typing essays. Um, and then also just talking to candidates um, informally, I think generally it's an acceptable format. And even, even without this uh, COVID situation, we've had many times when candidates have sometimes requested that they type because they find it easier than writing. So we'll just have to wait and see what happens with that. It's an interesting we, question. We, we, we are actually allocating a little bit more time. I don't know if Helen wants to confirm that um, you know, for the typing. Yeah, we're, we're adding an additional five minutes per hour to um, anything where it's not a multiple choice question, um, just to, to compensate a little bit for that. Because um, we do recognise that there are people who um, can handwrite faster than they can type, but there are also people who can type faster than they can handwrite. So um, just whilst we get used to the way things are moving, um, there'll be that little bit of extra time just to add in as compensation. I can see that people are using the chat option for this, which um, I'm keeping an eye on, but we might need to answer those questions afterwards. But I can see that um, Jo Martin, our president, joined us and she's just put a comment in to say it's also about content and not how much you write. So I just thought I'd pass that on. <laughs> Thanks very much, everyone. Uh, will calculators be needed for the part one examination in clinical biochemistry and how will the use of calculators be regulated during the exam? There is actually a calculator feature within the system which we will get applied to that if when, it, if when we've tested it, it turns out it doesn't have the functions then we will probably look at allowing candidates to bring a simple scientific cal calculator that they can prove doesn't have any internet connectivity to the proctor into the exam just for basic calculations but we do aim in the part one clinical biochemistry to um, have questions that shouldn't need a calculator just because of the very short length of time that candidates have to answer each question. Thanks Helen, thank you. Um, how is the standardised exams uh, Sorry, how is this it standardized exam if speed of typing is variable? Is it not enough time to practice? It's not enough time to practice typing while preparing for exams at unprecedented circumstances. So I think we've kind of addressed that um, already with a previous answer. Um, how come exam fees have not been reduced? Shall I do that one? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, um, so uh, yes, this is a question that's come up a couple of times. Um, so it's true to say that there have been some savings that have been made by moving um, the exams online. Um, for those exams that take place outside of the college and obviously we're not having to hire those um, and there are other associated costs um, that we won't be paying. However, as was explained at the very beginning of um, the webinar, this new system that we have does come with quite a hefty price tag. So it's costing approximately £150,000 um, for this session alone, for the autumn session. Um, and there are also other additional costs that we will be incurring. So um, things like making sure we have enough PPE um, for those candidates that are doing face-to-face -face examinations um, and, and all of those types of things. So there is no reduction in the exam fee, but equally we are not passing any costs on to trainees. So the fee that you've paid is the fee that you would have expected to pay um, under any circumstances. Lovely. Thanks very much, Joe. Thank you. Um, an obvious concern with candidates able to take the exam at home is that it will essentially be open book. Is there too much reliance on probity? So the, the exams will all be live proctored. There will be an invigilator staring at everybody from the other side of the screen for the entire duration of the exam. They are able to communicate directly with the candidates so if anyone is behaving I want to say suspiciously, but I do want to say suspiciously. So if someone is consistently looking down in a particular direction, um, they, would, they would say, oh, I noticed that you keep looking down in a particular direction. What are you looking at? Is there something very interesting that you'd like to share with me? Um, 
also the the environment check should counter that as well that um the proctor will be able to pick up on if there are things like if people have their revision notes out in an obvious place um the the desk setting that candidates are going to use where their computer is is going to be checked obviously things like if someone does go to the toilet that's um you know that's that's okay because it's the three hour exam but if someone is going every five minutes for example or is going for a prolonged period of time that's also going to be raised any suspicious behavior is then raised with us afterwards and we can review the footage and and pick up on that i can also add that so most colleges um employ a degree of psychometrics that relates to looking at how um questions are answered in terms of keystrokes so most colleges employ some keystroke analysis to try and identify if there are candidates that are doing the same things at the same time, for example, to see if there's collusion that way. And the, the performance analysis that you do as part of the standard psychometrics will identify unusual results. So actually, I would say in terms of this, this is nothing like open book. And I think the other thing just to add on that as well is that one of the things that we were looking at when we went through the tendering process is how open the exam is. So in terms of once a candidate has answered a question, you know, can they go back and forth um, and flip about the exam? And so this system doesn't allow that as well. So, you know, even if you thought, oh, my textbook in the bathroom, everyone's obsessed with using the bathroom to cheat, by the way. But my textbook in the bathroom will tell me that answer. So I'm, I'm going to, you know, if you've gone past that question, you won't, you can't, you can't go back and um and change your answer lovely thank you very much everybody um will we be able to use electronic drawing implements i.e e drawing pad for the frc path part one exams or will there be an appropriate tool to draw diagrams there is a diagram drawing feature in the software that allows you to incorporate those into your answers okay great thank you um, the delay in the exam has cost me heavily personally. What will the college do if it delays the exam again for those who should have finished and CCT by now? So I guess I'll take that one as well. Um, okay, so in general, we did some analysis quite near the beginning of lockdown just to look at the effect of the cancellation of the spring exams. Looking at the trainees that we register, so that's all of the cellular pathology trainees, uh, infection, um, and chemical pathology, we estimated that we had approximately 130 trainees that were delayed um, through training. Some of those trainees um, were already delayed, so that's the sort of maximum number. Um, and that also includes trainees who were delayed through not being able to take the part one as well as the part two. Um, obviously, we're in a pandemic. The college didn't start the pandemic, um, <laughs> so there are some. There are a lot of these things that are are beyond our control. What we are trying to do um, and working very hard to do is make sure that we can deliver the exams in the autumn session. Um, and we have not turned anybody away that has applied. Um, we have made space for everybody. Obviously, the online system helps with that. Um, but for the face-to-face -face examinations, for our biggest specialties, we've put on um, a, an additional uh, attempt in January as well, um, in order that we can get through, get the, the trainees through as, as quickly as we possibly can. We've already discussed the, the what ifs, and you know we all know that there could be a local lockdown. Hopefully, you know we won't go back to a national lockdown but we will have to I think be able to deal with those um, as they as they come up we've looked into the risks of this running exams is risky it is a risky activity anyway but we've we've considered the risks um, and we are doing everything we possibly can to try and get the the candidates through thanks very much Joe thank you um, can one hire a professional typist or can the system accept automatic dictation that could be instantly corrected by the candidate as the answer goes? So, no, you can't hire a professional typist. You are expected to type your own exam answers. Um, I'm trying to remember. I, I know that the system is compatible with um, text-to-speech software off the top of my head, whether it's compatible the other way around. I would have to go back and, and double check some things on that as to what, what software it might be compatible with. But certainly we, we have checked about text to speech so that it can read questions aloud to you if nothing else. 
thanks, Alan. If yeah, we could if we could check check that out, that'd be great. Um, the next question about calculators we've already covered. Um, will consideration be given to candidate location, re part two haematology exams, to avoid unnecessary travel, e.g., keep Scottish candidates in Scotland? Yes, we are trying to, wherever possible, minimise the travelling and having to stay away from candidates as we possibly can. Thank you. Um, and or similar to previous, I think there's already been a reply to this one. Will the software allow for flow diagrams and tables in the essay questions in part one? So can we put tables into the answers if necessary? Lovely. Okay. Um, allowing a private exam company to film and record us in our own homes with access to our home computers has its own issues, RE security. Uh, yeah, so uh, this is a GDPR question. So um, again, that was something that we considered really carefully when we were going through the tender process and there will be um, agreements in place between us and TestReach. Um, in terms of having access to the home computers, I think candidates seem to be worried that, that the company will be able to go in and look into what they've got stored and that's certainly not the case. They do um, they will be able to lock down your screen so that you obviously can't access um, the internet or, or any other notes and things that you hold on your um, your device. Um, but they certainly can't access your files and all of that kind of stuff in, in your computer. So um, we would like to reassure people about that. All right, thanks, Joe. Um, can you confirm the date of the chat exam, please? Will the face-to-face -face sessions be held on the same day? And when will we be informed? So the date for the chat exam is on the website. Um, off the top of my head, I can't remember. It's sometime in October and possibly on Friday. But that narrows it down. Five it might be 23rd, <laughs> I think. It might be 23rd. I think so. Yeah. Where we will hopefully be holding everything on the same day. It's just we've had to separate set the separate out the face to face stations. So hopefully what we do is run the the written stations in either the morning or the afternoon and the face to face stations on the other half of the day. But we should be able to finalise the information about that in the next week or so. Thank you, Helen. Um, will there be any changes to the format um, of part one FRC path haematology, in particular the essays, and will it still be the long essays or short format questions? So there are no changes in the format of the exam and um, we'll be following the same models as the past papers that are available on the website. Thank you. Um, and when will Immunology FRC Path Part 2 dates be confirmed? Candidates will need to book study leave and will dates be announced with, the, with less than six weeks notice? We will try not to go for less than six weeks notice, but we're still waiting for examiner availability to be confirmed for dates on those. Okay, thank you. Um, will the exam contain any specific questions on COVID-19 given the rapidly evolving literature? Um, no, so um, no, the, the exams will um, remain as testing the curriculum, so um, you should prepare as normal for the examination in line with what's expected for you to learn and know from your curriculum. Thank you. Um, so from correspondence, uh, links for IT system check and practice of the test street software will be sent at the end of August. Um, why can this not be done sooner? So we, I covered, sort of covered this earlier, but it's, there's quite a lot of things we have to do behind the scenes with test reach to get everybody loaded into the system, get all the papers in there as well. So it's, it's a case of once we've got everything in place, we can get the, um, get the links out. But it will be done as soon as possible. Yeah. Thank you. Um, is there any contingency in a case a candidate was required to evacuate the building during the exam, for example, a fire alarm that might take some time to resolve? So that we would follow the same principle as um, I would imagine for when this happens in normal circumstances. We do remind candidates that um, they're under exam conditions if there is a fire alarm. Um, we might have to come up with something slightly different if there's a fire alarm and 
someone is sitting the exam in their workplace or at home I think in the workplace it's slightly easier you can make sure that, that you have someone with you at all times so you can confirm that you're not standing on your phone outside in the hospital car park quickly googling all the answers that you may or may not have thought of um, so that that would probably be the contingency for that if, if that happened and you're sitting an exam in the workplace thank you um, with regards to clinical chemistry practical exam how will this be now held and how how will the uniformity be maintained at four different centers so this exam is there are no changes to how the exam is going to be run um, it will be the same paper in every sense that we're running um, so it's just smaller numbers more centers but exactly the same material across all centers in the same way that we do it for um, histopathology and haematology okay, lovely thank you um, I have access to a backup computer or device should the main device fail. Um, if this occurs, is it possible to resume the exam from a backup device if needed? Um, I would have to get some advice on that. Is it possible that um, they could ask that during um, testing, perhaps, you know, with, with the company? Is that possible to get guidance on that? Maybe. Yeah. Okay, lovely. That would be great if we could find, find out about that. Um, what is the status of the year one part A examination in clinical biochemistry given the GMC curriculum changes now underway? I'll, I'll take that one. Um, so normally, under normal circumstances, when you're making quite big changes to curricula and um, examinations, the GMC like you to um, not say too much to candidates or trainees until that change has been confirmed. Um, but uh, what we have been looking at for the stage A exam is because for both uh, chemical pathology and histopathology, they are being removed from the new curricula that have been submitted to the GMC. Um, the chemical pathology curriculum has already been approved with conditions, so that will be starting next August. Um, we're still waiting to hear for histopathology, but we've provided evidence about um, why we would like to remove those examinations and what we will be doing in their place in order to ensure that candidates are appropriately assessed through training. Um, what we've asked the GMC as part of the temporary change process is if we can bring the removal of those stage A exams forward. So i.e. that trainees who are in ST1 in the year that's just finished and the trainees that started this week um, will not have to do those examinations, um, but they will be required to produce alternative evidence to show that they have um, completed the uh, first year of their curriculum appropriately and been assessed appropriately. So we are still waiting to hear back from that, which is why um, we've not put any, any exams on as yet. Um, and uh, we've just got a holding notice for the chemical pathology trainees who are the first ones that were due to be sitting um, the exam. We felt that being as it's an exam that where candidates would have to come together uh, and travel, um, that the best thing to do would be to move to that change slightly earlier. What will happen is, um, assuming that we get approval from the GMC, as soon as we do, we'll obviously write out and let everybody know. The ARCP de derogation guidelines that came out early on in the year will be amended for chemical pathology and histopathology to indicate to those trainees that probably got a 10.1 I think it would have been 10.1 outcome um, in the ARCPs that have just happened, what evidence they will need to provide for their next ARCP um, and all being well, if they provided that evidence plus, plus whatever else they need for this year, then they will be able to progress through training as normal. But we can't confirm anything, unfortunately, until the GMC have given us approval. Lovely. Thank you very much, Joe. Thank you. Uh, for Clinical Biochemistry Part 2, Module 1, will we be given the full pack of OSPI questions in one go, or will we get a new question handed out every nine minutes? Um, as far as I'm aware, this is sort of one of those things that's still under discussion, but it won't be a, a rotating OSPI like we would normally be doing. It will be a, a sit down for the full duration of it, and a new question starts every nine minutes. What I'm not sure if it's been fully decided yet is if everyone will get everything at once and told 
which question to then answer or if there will be a different one given out every nine minutes. I imagine probably the former just to minimise any kind of risk of an invigilator having to be permanently wandering around in the room slightly closer to people than we'd be trying to set an example about at the current time. That would be consistent for all trainees, won't it? Yeah, yeah it will be consistent across centres, whatever route we decide to go down. Okay, lovely, thank you, Helen. Um, for international candidates, will they, be, will they be allowed to withdraw penalty-free penalty closer to the exam if local COVID restrictions prevent travel? Yeah, I think there's an answer on this one about that, that um, again, the nearer it is to the time because the, the deadline for withdrawing without loss of fee is, is already gone. But if there's just some supporting evidence um, that says that they can't travel, then, then that would be entirely reasonable to withdraw without losing the examination fee at that point. Okay, thank you. Um, could we use the college's online exam system to run a mock part two exam next month? No, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, we, we can't, as well, we, we don't have any involvement in mock exams um, and also the cost of it would be prohibitive, so. I expect some other people that are normally run mock exams are trying, to, um, will be looking into ways of actually trying to deliver some of these things that they need, the courses and things, etc., um, as quickly as they possibly can, I imagine. Yeah, it's just, we can't have any direct involvement in any mock exams. Um, we can't let people have access to the system, at least on our account anyway. <laughs> Thank you. Um, what guidance will be given to deaneries with regards to extensions to training required as a result of postponing some candidates FRC PATH Part 2 exam to January? So we, we asked the candidates who were offered either an October or January sitting as to which one they will prefer to be sitting in and as far as I'm aware everyone was allocated their first choice and we did emphasise and we have emphasised all the way through that candidates should take that level of decision with the support of their educational supervisor and everybody else so hopefully that shouldn't affect anyone but I don't know if Joe's got anything to add into that at deanery level. Sorry I missed the original question Matthew what did you say? Um, so what guidance will be given to deaneries with regards to extensions to training required as a result of postponing some candidates FRC PATH Part 2 exams to January? Okay, um, well as Helen said, it, uh, it, yeah, I suppose you could view it as a postponement, but candidates have been able to, to choose when they, when they want to sit the exam. Um, as I've said, we do also have the um, derogation guidance for candidates in the cellular pathology specialties where there is a requirement to um, undertake 12 months of stage D training after the part two. We've already had it agreed that that can be shortened to six months as long as they obviously have appropriate evidence of having met all of the requirements of the curriculum that's in place. Um, the derogation guidance was approved by the GMC across the board for all specialties until the end of this month, but they have written out to us in the last week or so to say that obviously that's now going to be extended. So I expect that we will be revising the ARCP guidance uh, derogation for all specialties uh, at some stage during the year just to make sure that we have um, fully covered everything but there is some derogation in place already um, for for those trainees so if you're a histopathology trainee um, you you do have some flexibility already the guidance is on the college website please go and have a look at it and if you have got questions then please contact the training department as well they'll be able to help you. Lovely, thank you very much. Um, we've got another question about typing, but we've already covered that. So there is extra time given for each exam based on that principle. Um, micro has been extended now to three days. How will the orals work? So we've extended it to three days just to accommodate the face-to-face -face components of the OSPI because we'll be delivering those separately on Microsoft Teams. So once the timetable has been finalised, for those candidates will be sent a time to log in and the link to log in to Microsoft Teams for that and will be a little bit like this but without many many people on it so it will be candidates who examiners for the duration. 
Why not to, uh, consider cancelling the assays from part one haematology? It's clearly unfair to disadvantage candidates with lesser IT skills, especially those from overseas. So we can't make any changes to the, the content or the um, format of the exam without permission from the GMC. So we've, we have to maintain the exam in, in the format that has been approved. Thanks, Helen. Um, the wait between the exam and result day is very long, especially for those whose exam was cancelled in spring. Will it be possible to release results earlier? Um, and that's unfortunately a very straightforward no answer to that. It's just because it takes the time between the exam and the results day to make sure that we have, um, well, for a lot of exams, that there's sufficient time for the examiners to actually mark the, the papers, bearing in mind that all of our examiners are, are doing this on a purely voluntary basis on top of their, their day jobs. Um, we then have to compile all the results. We have to go through them, check them, ensure we're giving the right results to the right candidates. Um, things like MCQs, whilst they don't, well, they do, they do take as long um, because we have to look at item performance, question performance, candidate performance, making sure that we've kept the right questions in, if there are any questions that have to come out. Um, making sure that the standard has been set appropriately and again that the right candidate is going to get the right result on the 20th of November. Okay, thank you Helen. Um, when do you anticipate letting candidates know the location of their face-to-face -face examination as booking transport and accommodation may be difficult? So we aim for about six weeks before the exam as an absolute minimum just so that people have time to arrange themselves obviously it's we have to make sure we've again that we've, we're getting the right candidates in the right centers and that does take a little bit of time um and just checking that you know things things are in place like um the examiners don't know the candidates or the candidates don't know the examiners where they're going so thank you um Will we be able to withdraw with a full refund if the software does not suit how we have revised answering questions once we've had a chance to trial this? I'm not 100% certain quite what the question is, is getting at, but um, the, uh, there's no, no, if they can. Yeah, there's no, change, there's no change to the format of the exam. So that's, I mean, that's, that's really where we're at with, with that one. So there are past papers, there are sample papers on the website. I think. But there, there's no no way to your knowledge that if they weren't happy with the software and they tried it, um, they they just well. just uh, uh, interviewing the, the companies when we did after the tendering process. Um, not all of them, you know, were quite confident that the software is fairly friendly to use. So I don't anticipate problems with with any of this, really speaking. And also to to remember that. Um, um, all, all companies, including TestReach, that um, we are going to uh, be using, already do exams with some of the colleges, some other colleges. So those sort of issues, I don't think, have arisen. And if they have, they probably have ironed them out by now. Of course, this move to online assessment has swept through most of undergraduate and most of postgraduate medical education, if not all, at speed. So I, I don't think we're really doing anything here that other colleges, other institutions aren't doing as well. Okay, thank you everyone. Um, could the exam be open book to make it fair across the board? Um, it would help to eliminate concerns, re cheating? No, there's, there's no plan for that. So I'll just say it again, don't cheat. <laughs> um, and also don't email us and tell us how you're planning on cheating in the toilet either. Um, with online invigilators via webcam slash mic, if doing the exam at work in a room with other candidates, does each PC need a webcam slash mic, or is it one in in, in the room? Okay, is one in the room okay? Um, well, as I've said earlier, we we don't recommend that you have multiple candidates in the same room doing the exam, and it's each individual device needs a webcam and mic. But really, we shouldn't be having groups of candidates sitting and examining the same room just for, you know, to make sure that nobody's cheating with each other in there. You haven't got a little Morse code system set up. Hello, thank you. Um, are masks required during the Histo part two exams? Uh, 
they, I think what we're looking at at the moment is they won't be compulsory, but if candidates want to wear one, then they can do. Because obviously we, we recognise some people will be exempt from wearing them as well. So it would be unfair to make them sit for two days wearing one doing their exam. Okay, thank you, Helen. Um, if a ca candidate at short notice cannot sit the Histo Part 2 exam in October, self-isolation or COVID, could there be places left available in January for them? Um, again, I think we covered this one earlier that we would look at it on a case-by-case -case basis. And if, if there were places, we could look at moving them into January. Okay, thank you. Um, why is the part two module one a clinical biochemistry exam not online when other colleges e.g. GP have been able to move their face-to-face -face exams online? Um, because we can't deliver the bench practical component of that online in its current format so that still has to be done in person. I, I did also speak to the GPs about that this week, Matthew. Um, so again, they're another college that has large numbers, but sing, you know, single format. They have also completely changed their examination. Um, so they've gone back to a previous version of their exam in order to be able to run it online um, and did the whole thing in 12 weeks, including um, GMC approval. There was quite substantial pressure for them to um, to make that change and get it through obviously in order to make sure we've got enough GPs coming out at the other end so um, that's why the, the GPs have have been able to do it but it was quite a, a tough 12 weeks by the sounds of it. Thank you. Um, what are the plans about the subspecialty exams so peds and perinatal neuropath and forensic pathology exams will they be held in the same format as histopath? No, they, um, they, they will be held as, as normal, as we would do normally. Um, but there'll be social distancing measures and obviously enhanced hygiene measures in place um, just to, as a mitigation. Thank you. Um, part two histopathology in Scotland is a single deanery and our candidates normally have to go outside of Scotland to sit the exam. Will this be relaxed? So as we said earlier, we're, we're looking to where we possibly can minimise the level of travel and having to stay away that, that candidates are going to need to do this session. There will, unfortunately, there will always be some people who have to travel, but we are looking to minimise that as much as we possibly can. Matthew, can I just give you a five minute warning uh, <laughs> for the end of the session? So if anybody does have any burning questions that are on Slido, if they want to vote now to uh, if, if we don't get to them all, then we will answer them afterwards and put them up on the college website. Thank you, Joe. Um, I've got one. Our trust is very awkward. Are we allowing externals in and are unlikely to allow computer to be taken over? Has this happened elsewhere and how has it been overcome? Have you had any contact with other colleges and things about that, Joe? Um, no, I mean, I think some colleges are actually using test centres, but obviously that requires the candidates to travel to um, those test centres. If there is um, an issue with um, being able to use a trust device to sit your exam, then we would advise the candidates to um, find another advice, you know, device, um, you know, do it from home or from uh, friend or relative's home as long as you know goes along with what we've been saying before about making sure you've got a quiet space private space to, to do it in um, if there are those issues and you know about them in advance then there is time to um, come up with an alternative lovely um, and there was another question that I, I can't find at the moment but there was one about the year one examinations Joe um, have you got an update about what the situation is regarding those at the moment yeah, that's the, the stage A ones. We've we've covered that. So we are hoping that they um, that we will move to the new arrangements that are in the new curriculum and that candidates will not have to sit those, but will be required to provide alternative evidence in time for their next ARCP. But we'll notify everyone of that as soon as we hear from the GMC. Lovely. Thank you. Um, just looking through any other ones. Uh... Um, will it, uh, uh, I 
think a lot of these we've addressed already. Um, uh, what options are available for candidates with severe dyslexia and slow typing speed? Is there an option to use a voice recorder? I think, well, Helen, you're going to have a look into that um, potentially. Yes, yeah, so it, it's really whatever is compatible with the system. We can't, we won't be offering the examination in any, in any other format. And so, people can still apply for extra time and things as you, as the yes. usual sort of system. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, I, I have a new computer system going live that week. If the trust IT changes in some way near the exam, is there a way of asking for help or advice nearer the exam? I think that's that's kind of been covered by Joe's answer to the fairly similar question previously that if suddenly it looks like it's going to be a problem for how you'd plan to take the exam to have a contingency plan in place just in case okay, thank something you. does go really wrong. <laughs> I'm, sorry, I'm, I'm just intrigued because of course normally our, our candidates go elsewhere to do their exams so, so now the the um, suggestion that candidates are going to be doing their exams at work is that because of technology that's available um, is it because they're expected to work that day as well which would seem remarkably unfair I'm just wondering what the what the thinking process is behind students coming or trainees coming in to do the exam at work might be something to, con to consider. I think it was we wanted to offer them and people an option of where they sat so some people just don't have a, a suitable home environment you know if people have small children that unfortunately they're you know they're going to be around and yelling throughout or for example I live over the road from a primary school where they're very fond of being out of doors all the time so there's no way I'd be able to sit an exam um, at home and focus for the three hours so it was to offer people the option of if if it just if home just wasn't a suitable environment to be sitting and examine them the workplace might be better. Thank you um, and will trainees be able to look forward and go back to questions for SAQs to add bits later on and correct if necessary or is it a one way through exam? Um, as far as I'm aware for, for those sorts of questions there will be a, an option to go between them that there will be some formats of questions for example the OSPs where they're timed questions and as soon as you've had your time on that question that's the end of the story um, but for everything else there should be a it, it will be the same the same way as you're sitting it on paper and in relation to that the OSPs and will will the um, how will the communication stations the OSPs be delivered will these be on teams Yes, they'll be delivered on teams and they'll be delivered separately to either so rather than you'll do three written stations and then have to do a face-to-face -face station you'll do all of the um written stations in one go and all of the face-to-face -face elements separately thank you Helen. matthew i'm just looking through the chat that people have been using as well um hannah um from the exams team has been doing a sterling job of answering people on that as well but there is a question about what happens if my internet goes down which we haven't addressed it is addressed in the faqs okay um, that are already on the website but do we just helen would you just like to give an answer to that one as well because that's come up quite a bit in the chat from what i can see yeah so the the system is designed to operate with absolute minimal internet connectivity even my absolutely appalling home internet could probably cope with it um, the, it, it is designed to operate with absolute minimal internet connectivity and I think the only time that it could be a problem is if there's a complete outage of someone's internet and then again as with most things we'd consider that on a case-by-case -case basis um, depending on on the point of, of the outage so if somebody couldn't get on to do the exam at all um, so for example, if you're on Virgin Media and somebody cut the cable on your road and your entire street was out for the day, which you suddenly discovered on the morning of the exam, if you just if we were notified before you were unable to get onto the exam, then that will be a different scenario to if you were halfway through and something cut out and you'd already seen half of the paper. And again, even if it, it jumps in and out, it's still the system can cope with that quite happily. Yeah, it's basically it's it's basically an, app, an application that's downloaded onto your computer, um, so it doesn't really need to have anything 
significant money in the background to operate it's just when you come to submit the answers at the end mm. and as I'm, as I'm thinking as well helen that before you even start the exam there's a check that they you can do just to double check at the beginning that everything there's a okay. there's a device a device check that's done beforehand that you need to do on the device you're planning on taking it on ideally in the same spot that you'll be taking the exam in because sometimes it's also the sort of thing that um the proctor will be able to say oh maybe you should move a bit closer to your router or you know maybe just give it a quick reset if things are starting to look a bit problematic um especially with some some home modems that sometimes just like to jump around a bit and not fully playable thank you helen there's just another question as well, Matthew, about can candidates practice, which again, we've covered, but they'll be about three weeks um, and they're not limited in terms of the number of times they can go in and have a look. So they've they've got plenty of time to familiarise themselves with the, the online system. It is also five past four. So we've slightly overrun, which I'm conscious of. Um, I think if everyone's happy on the panel, I think we've answered quite a lot of the questions and um there's been some duplicates but we've reiterated those points is there anything burning from your side matthew as a trainee that you would want to ask no i think um, from my side i think we've covered everything and um but as, and yeah but the trainees can continue to ask questions via um via the exams team um and, and the faq system will be continually updated as well won't it joe so if there are any other things that come out as a result of this as well then um people can still get in touch can't they they can yes yes well, thank um, you very much for the panel for actually doing this this is it's been very helpful and thank you very much on behalf of the trainees for that thank you thank Matthew. You. I know yeah thank you matthew for uh, for <laughs> taking all the the job of asking the questions in such a um you know a remarkable way it's been very very smooth <laughs> no problem thank you for help <laughs> And thank you everyone uh, for attending. As we've said, all of this will become available on the website in the next week or so. Um, please uh, let your trainees and your colleagues know about where the information is and the information that you've learned today if you do receive questions. And um, that's it for us from now. Thank you very much. Thank you.